On number nine, we have a tapered leg. On this taper, we're going to have two edges. We have one for the flat and one for the angled edge. The other thing that I want to show you is that we see that this hole only goes through one unit of depth. So we only have this going through here. We have to have the front view because of the hole and it gives us the shape of the part. The side view gives us the shape of the taper and the depth and this cut. This top view is important to understand this. Number one, this should not go all the way through there. The hole goes from here through here to here, just like it does right here. This doesn't go all the way through the end of that part like that. So this is also something that I would not have. We do have a hidden line right here. And what we're showing is that underside cut. Then we have our hole. And the taper of our legs doesn't come into play because these are in alignment. And all we have is this hidden edge. Then we would have a shortened, not as long as this one, hidden line right here for our hole. How many views do we need? I know I need this view, and I've got to have this view. This one I could put in if I want but I don't believe it's necessary because we can get the depth of our part right here. And I can't dimension anything that's hidden in this view. I can get the width of the part right here. Okay. So I'm going to move on now and we're going to go to the next exercise. And I wish this. I have a question. Through. Yes. Um, so how can we tell uh, how deep a borehole is? As in the previous example, you said it was only one uh, unit deep. Yes. Uh, and on, on the previous example we had before that, uh, it looked like the borehole actually extended all the way to the, to the inside. So I was just wondering how we could tell uh, what the, when we would actually have to stop uh, before hitting the back end of that, uh, uh, that other. Gotcha. Spot. Gotcha. Um, it's really hard to tell here, and you would have to have information on that. And I tried to tell you guys last time it's one unit, but it's really hard to tell. And if you can kind of eyeball it, um, you know, in your grid, maybe if you went from here to here and then you come back here, that might be one unit. Really hard to tell on that. So, you know, once again, if I had a dimension, it's going to tell the pilot hole diameter first. Then it will have a counterbore symbol or a flat bottom hole symbol. And then a diameter on that one for its size. And then it will have a depth symbol that looks like this. And that would tell somebody exactly how deep that is. So right now, hard to tell. Very good point. On this one. I can tell that it goes one unit because it stops right there at that back step. So this hole just goes one back step. And then once again, this is too long. It should just stop right there where my yellow line is not. Very good question. So at the moment, we should just assume that all boreholes extend all the way to the back end. Yes. And you can see the back of this one. And you can see that it's just clear back there. We don't have another counter bore, but that is the depth right here. So anytime you see a hole and you cannot see the back of it. Now, this one looks like a counter bore, but there's no material there. So that one goes all the way through. Good gotcha. question. Yeah, that's pretty clear. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. And this, this number one. And I'm not seeing that this, that this, um, that this presentation has each one of these one by one. And I wish it did. Let me see if this does. And it's not showing me one by one. So what we're going to do is we're going to look at the solutions. 
I'm going to talk to them about that because it's just so much better to talk through these things, having each one kind of larger. So let me just zoom in on this and maybe slide over here a little bit. Is that better for you guys? Okay, let's talk about the first one. Whoops. Okay, right there. Let me pull this this up. Here we go. All right, just scrolling. Okay, so this says this wants to be our front view. And we have our shape here. And I have to draw this right side view to get this angle. And then I can project this line over. The top view shows me that we have some full rounds on the edges of this part. Therefore, my legs on my holes are going, they're these are concentric holes. They show to be right in the center. So I'm going to have three legs that are long to extend beyond the largest of the two concentric objects. And then this one is short. Now, sometimes we also put what we call a continuation line here to show that these are in alignment. But we don't need to do that right here. I just wanted to show you that. How many views do we, do we need of this part, do you think? We need the full three on that one because of the radii and the uh, top view uh, and the angle in the right and view. The holes. Yes, we got to have the holes and the angle. So we need, if we have to have this view, which I think it's probably more descriptive to have all three too, we need the angle and we need the holes. Very good. On this part, this one is a little bit of a booger too. And this is another one that I might have drawn the top view first. Because it has all this profile stuff going on, we need this to dimension all that. And because these cuts go all the way through, we don't need another view to describe these weird cuts and angles on the outside perimeter. We need this top view for the hole. And we need the front view or this view for the height, the height of this step, the overall height. But then we just project these angles, these lines down. Now, we have the hole coming down in a hidden format, but then we have this edge overriding it in a second. So it's just going to cover over it. And we have this edge, we have this edge, this edge, and then this is all flat. So right here, we have a hidden edge, but it's overridden with a visible edge right here. You see those two in alignment. So we have a visible line down here only in the right side view. This is one where I definitely use my miter line and project this over, project this over, this, and this. And once again, we have these two in alignment, so we won't have a hidden edge right here. And I know I marked all over that. <clears throat> Do you notice that these two views look almost exactly the same, except that this is longer than this one? So to me, I might be able to get away with the top view and the front view because I can get the depth of the part right here. Any questions on that one? I'm having to speed up a little bit because I'm running out of time here. Let's go to number three. Um, we're going to start with this view. We get this weird profile, which we needed. And we needed this hole. The top view shows the break right here. Now we have a hidden back edge. There's a visible line right here for where it goes from an angle to a vertical line. But then we have over in the front view, we're going to have a hidden line right here showing that that is not solid all the way through. We have our hidden lines for our holes. This goes all the way through, so these extend. 
Now, if I come along here and I try and touch this bottom edge right here, can't touch it from the top view, can't touch this from the top view. So I have a hidden edge here for this bottom corner. I have a hidden edge from the west extent of the circle. The center line is overridden in the top view with a visible edge. Then I have the eastern quadrant of that circle and then another hidden line for this underside edge right there. So a little bit interesting on that one. And on this one, I show my castle blocks here. And notice that they're on, it stops on this plane, so I have no edge. You see that right there? I have no edge right here. It's just castle blocks protruding. Then I have a hole that comes through only to this point. So you see the end of that line should be in alignment with the end of that line. I have this edge for the difference in a vertical and angle plane right here. I have my hidden line for the top extent of this hole and the bottom extent of the hole is overridden by the visible line. And then I have my vertical hidden lines for my holes. How many views and which views? We have to have this top view, right? Because of the hole. It also locates these and shows me how big they are. This shows me how tall they are. We have to have this view for the profile and the hole. So maybe we could get away with two views and not have the right side view. If you think it's more descriptive having that, go for it. Any questions on that one? Yeah, how do we know that the, that the hole is not a through hole? The hole is a through hole. This hole only goes two units deep, though. Uh, so we're projecting it on the on okay on so the side view shows it only back. yes okay. yes so the center line is showing how deep the hole goes doesn't it and it yeah. and the center line stop right there showing that 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 hole stops right there too good question any other questions good job you guys so now we've got number four here, and it's this pyramid, kind of like a hip roof. It's angled on all sides and has a flat top. So from this primary view, I get my shape. So this is flat, and then I have an edge to an angled plane or an inclined plane. And I have this break for this step that goes right through it. That is two units. And you see this little half line. That's here because this is a half unit tall. This doesn't go all the way up. So therefore we have our hidden lines for that and that cut stops. We have no hidden lines where there's no geometry. It's only the edges where there is geometry. So see this, I have this hidden line stops and starts there and then it starts on the other side. This goes all the way through. And likewise, this goes all the way through. And this hole goes all the way through. So the hole stops where the geometry stops or the solid stops. In the top, we have the angles. You see these lines show the connection and the inclined plane edges. And then we have the flat top. We have our hidden lines for our cut this way through both sides and then vertically for the one unit tall cut right here. Do you guys think we need three views on this one? Absolutely. You've got two different sets of angles on the sides. In the front, Good. you get the uh, the profile of, of, look, of 45, and on the right side view, you get the profile of whatever that is, like a 30 or 60 or whatever. Yeah. yeah. But, but the, the also, angles. we have the depth of the step here and the depth of the step here that I cannot get in this view. However, I have a hole. So I have to have that view. I have to have this view and I have to have this view. I have to have all three of those. Very good. 
Let's go to number five here. And this one's a little bit weird, but I, the, I'm glad this is here. We never have to put a bullseye on a quarter round. Never, ever. If it's a full quarter round, and I say this is one, two units of a radius. Like if I called this out with a dimension, I would say this is a radius of two. That means it's one, two units to the center anywhere around that radius, right? So I know where the center is, and I'm never going to dimension to the center of a full round, I mean a quarter round. I'm always going to dimension the center of a, a half a semicircle or a full round or a circle from the center. So I have to have a center mark on full rounds and larger. Full rounds all the way up to a circle, I have to have a center mark. So we don't need a center mark on that bottom quarter round. So I'm just going to clarify this because we're not going to put it in a drawing. We will not have this one. We will not have that one, in other words. These two are in alignment, and I need this. So that's what that's for. And I need this because they're full. You know, they're 180 degree round, which we call a full round. It's not really a full round because that would be a circle, but it's a full semicircle. So quarter round never gets a center mark. And I see that in the next one too. And we're going to, and you, you know, if you have them in there, it's fine. You can erase it. That's fine. But because it's on here and you were given the solutions, I understand why you're, why you well, would have them in there. It, it raises a question though of, so the, the, they don't start, that quarter round, neither neither end of the arc starts directly on another, you know, some other connecting line. So the hidden lines there show the start and end of the arc. Okay, so this hidden line right here shows the end of this cut. Does that make sense? Well, I'm thinking in the top, so that's fine for the side view. Okay. But in the top view, because the arc is disconnected from uh, any other identifier. Yeah. That you well, have to. Let's, you have to say, let's say this is a radius of two. I know it's going to start two, the center will be two up from this side and two in from this side because it's on a quadrant and a quadrant. For a quarter round of a of a regular circle, it would be on the east and the south quadrant. If it's a radius of two, I'd come in to the left two, and I'd come up from the bottom two. That would be my center. And the only reason, you guys, that we put center marks is to try and locate something. That's really to help us locate something. So if you can think of it that way. Okay. Um, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I'll make a comment. So, those uh, lines we were just talking about uh, looks look to seem like uh, the radii, uh, radii lines, and right, so all right. Of those so that, that would pretty much uh, give the, the the radius for that half circle. Yeah. I mean, quarter circle there. Yeah. If I put a radius dimension out here, that would tell me exactly where the center is. If I put a radius dimension on this one, that doesn't tell me where the center of that is because it's not on the corner of the part. Does that make a little bit more sense? If it's on the corner of the part, I can measure from here and here, whatever the radius is. If the radius of this is two, I go in two and up two. But I can't really locate this one with the radius. It just tells me how wide it is. It doesn't tell me how far in it is. It doesn't tell me how far up it is because it's not on the edge of a part. If a quarter round is on the edge of a part, you don't need a center mark. And that's usually just to knock off a sharp, right? That's why we have those. Now we have this little one by one notch right here. We have this descriptive, you know, this is the same as a whole. We have to locate that. So we need this view. 
And notice that we have what we call a little landing. It's a flat. So we have an angle and an angle, and then it comes to a one by one flat. So that's why those lines cross. In this view, it's a little bit strange and my highlighter is so big, but we have the edge of the part out here. And then we have this little edge right here for this little line, the second one from the right. And then we have the other edge for this other notch. This is going to be a solid line all the way across because we go from a vertical surface to an angled surface. Now in this view, we're going to have the same thing. And using a miter line here is very important because I can come from the extent of the part and then I come from this little notch edge right there down to that little line right there. And then I have the other side of that notch right here. Do not need this center mark. Uh-oh. That's my alarm. We have 10 minutes. We do not need this center mark. If I don't put this bullseye here, which we never need in a quarter round on the edge of a part, or think about it. If I had an injection molded part that was, had curves everywhere, I'd have center marks everywhere. And I'm not locating those. Um, they're just knocking off a corner. I'm not locating where that is. I'm just saying how big that is, if that makes any more sense. So I don't need this one. I need this one because I am going to have a bullseye right here. And with this arc or with this slot, I'm going to call this an arc uh, slot. Um, I'm going to draw something here. I'm going to draw this slot. I'm going to have a plus right here. And then I'm going to have three legs. I'm going to have one going up. This is not letting me draw like here, here, and here. No leg down here because there's no arc. There's no material. So once I have one of these, I'm going to have this in the adjacent views. And that's only for that right there. I showed the back of the notch in this primary view right here. And then I have the visible edges of that notch right here. Once again, I have a plane all the way across because I'm going from a vertical to an angle. Quick question. What, what are yes. those uh, lines extending? Oh, so you see where that uh, that cross is, but what are those lines extending uh, away from the cross? Give them a little Like space. this? Yes, those. These little feet. So anytime we have 180 degree all the way up to a full circle, we have a little mark for the center. And then we show the legs extend beyond the circular object. So we have a little gap to our legs and they go outside the circle showing that it's not geometry. So that that's what we call a bullseye. So if you ever looked at a target or if you look at the scope, it's gonna have a circle and the crosshairs are gonna go through that circle, right? Yes. So that's kind of the same thing. And if you only have a three-sided circle such as that round there you're only going to have three legs because there's no material over here gotcha. so it's essentially just uh displaying where the arc is for for that yes instrument. yes exactly gotcha. so we wouldn't just have a little plus in the middle we're going to have legs with a little gap extending beyond that arc because remember, we're going to extend beyond the circular object. So we don't want to have a big plus. We want to have a little plus and then the legs extending beyond that. Gotcha. Yeah, that's um, much more clear. Thank you. You're welcome. All right. We've got another one here that has center marks. We don't need these center marks on quarter rounds. This is a quarter round to blend. Now let's talk about these quarter rounds. Why do I have these quarter rounds in the first place? When you add material with a quarter round, it strengthens this feature to the base. That's adding material. It's strengthening that. But sometimes we knock off an edge 
with a quarter round. And that's called a fillet or a round or a radius. All right. And well, you know, uh, yes. Is it possible? So when you were talking about, say, an injection molded part where um, you're, you're knocking off edges to I could you make the argument that so, some of them are done for safety? For instance, you may not want sharp edges on a part right. like this. But, uh -huh. but in that case, if that was, say, a real part, is it possible that that is a uh, a functional radius as opposed to just a, you know, something that you're either knocking off an edge because for safety purposes or um, knocking off an edge because injection molded parts automatically kind don't they, I think they automatically do not you're, have sharp edges. You're absolutely right. Now you guys in an injection molding tool, you have fillets on everything. I don't care if it's the thickness of a piece of paper because it's hard for molten plastic to turn a sharp 90. You're always wanting that to flow like a river. A river doesn't have sharp edges. It has curvature that's tangent so that water can flow through. And an injection mold tool has to be the same thing. Also, it's really hard to pull apart out of the tool when it has sharp edges. So the rounds and the fillets are actually functional to help, number one, the material to flow, but number two, to pull the part out. If you pull it out of, let's say, a positive out of a negative a cavity that has a round, it's a lot easier to pull out. But if there's a sharp, it's going to try and stick. It causes, it's a, actually, I think that it causes a vacuum in there because you have uh, no way for the air to flow through. You're as right. You're, it apart. You're right. It's the, the, the quite, there are, so in this, for instance, on this part, the argument could be made that the radiuses are there for an actual significant functional purpose other than just the inexactness of yes. injection molding. And so yes. they, then they would need a radius because they have to be machined to that radius as opposed to just kind of winding up there. Right. This one right here is for strength. When you see a radius that adds material to the part, it's actually adding strength. It's adding strength between this vertical plane. So if I put pressure on this right here, this is the stress point. If this were absolutely a corner, all the stress would be right there in that corner. So in order to displace that stress in these two areas, we put a fillet here so that it strengthens those two features to each other. So sometimes, just like if I went and put a weld there, if I had a weld right here, but I didn't have a weld right here, that's going to be weak. So if I put that weld in, it kind of makes a fillet and it displaces that stress around that corner. So there are definitely reasons to have fillets. Um, if they are a quarter round, though, however, to dimension things on a part, we don't need a center mark. So I can tell exactly where that is. If you call that out with a radius of one, I can tell where the center is. I don't need to dimension that to make this part. I need to dimension the width of this and where these come together. So think about center marks as locating features. I don't need those. I don't need this. I don't need this. And I don't need this axial center line. Do you notice that we also don't have a hard edge right here? You see where we don't have one right here? That's blended together. We don't have one right here either. So we don't see a hard edge here. We see one here because we have a plane there. But when things are what we call blended out or completely blended, tangent, that means they flow without an edge. It's completely sanded. If you can imagine sanding two parts so that you cannot see an edge, that's what tangency is. And at any angle, you can make an arc tangent to it. But usually on a vertical line, it's on the quadrant. On a horizontal line, it's on a quadrant. That makes it tangent and not have an edge. So we have our hidden, we have our visible edges here. We have our hidden edges for our hole. We have our visible 
cut right here. We have our fillets right here. And we get our depth of our part. We have a lot of profile going on right here. Is there anything that I can't get in these two views that I need this one for? We have one minute. We don't really need this view. But you, you were instructed to draw all three. Now we are one minute shy of class being over and we're gonna come back in on Thursday. What I'm gonna give you for exercise is I want you to draw the next two sheets for, for I'm sorry, this is Wednesday, isn't it? I want you to draw the next two sheets for Monday. And I'm gonna give you that in an announcement. I'm gonna give you a Blackboard link. So you cannot uh, pull that up from an email. When I send you an announcement, I'm gonna send it and let it send an email to you. You have to go to Blackboard to click on that link for it to come up, but it's gonna have a link to the next two exercises. That will be 2.3, 2.4. And I want you to draw the same thing as we're going over. But when we come back, we're gonna start right here on number seven. And we'll go through the next two sheets. It won't take us as much time because we've kind of described this and had some conversation around it in this class. So this fourth, uh, video is going to go up to number seven in 2.2. .2. Okay, any questions on that, you guys? Hold on to these sheets. I'm going to ask you to send them to me so that I can look it over and maybe give you some feedback on it. This is not for a grade, so don't get nervous. This is just for just getting used to this because this is exactly what we're going to do in AutoCAD. All right. And it's going to be a lot easier if you understand it here. And we, when we get to AutoCAD, it's going to be like, oh, I only need two views. Or maybe I ask you to draw three views anyway. You're going to know how to project your geometry. Any questions before I stop? And I will be on for 30 minutes more to 1130. Um, yes, we are going to use AutoCAD. Sure are. And deburring is right, Daniel. You're absolutely right. Uh, is it Jarrell or Gerald? Gerald was asking, who's in the construction drafting field? Are you asking that of the class? Okay. Is anybody in here and now... I know uh, some of us have already been using 3D. I think uh, Alex, I'm sorry if I said that wrong. Uh, Albert, Albert has been using it. My yeah, I use it for uh, uh, 3D printing. 3D uh, printing. Yeah, I have multiple 3D printers. Uh, and really, it's just kind of an enthusiast thing that I'm a frustrated architect. So, you know, that part I haven't actually done anything with, but the 3D printing, I use uh, Rhino a lot to design parts and things like that. Okay, so let me just say that when you start out in a field or with a company, you may be making drawings for someone that's making parts. Then you will move from a drafter to a designer. And it takes a little bit for you to understand that companies product and it also takes a bit a bit for people to get confidence in you that you know what you're doing so you know some and I'm going to tell you this as an engineer I had to make my own drawings you know um, so it doesn't matter you know where you start out in the field you will always be making drawings always so it's really important to know this stuff even if I were going up on the whiteboard and trying to explain something to someone, and I'm always drawing uh, because I think I'm a visual person and I think people can get that better than me trying to explain it um, verbally. So being able to draw something is extremely helpful. Doesn't matter what field you're in. Does that answer your question? Here's Daniel says he worked in a large scale 3D printing company as a chief quality inspector. And see, that's awesome. 
So you're used to looking at drawings and seeing if the parts match that drawing. So we're going to see now how the dimensions and the design intent tell you how to inspect it, right? And, you know, if something's dimensioned from one side, you don't inspect it from the other. So we're going to start linking all that stuff together. And Santiago says he's in the engineering field. And GIS background. Oh, yeah. Civil 3D is way different than GIS, right? But it's good to know. That's pulling everything together, Santiago. That's that's really getting you both sides of that whole that whole field. Well, and I'm going to be going, I'm actually, I'm doing GIS as part of a, uh, leading into uh, archaeology or awesome. related field. Um, and this is my actual, uh, this is my elective for GIS. GIS, yeah. This is awesome. Because, you know, it's it's all about spatial relationship. And we talked about that in the very first day. I don't care if it's civil, architectural, mechanical, even elect electrical. You have design rules in electronics yeah. design too. So spatial relationships, very important. And understanding the geometry when you look at something to envision that as being something real in your hand or envision that as being something real in the field. That's very important. Thank you guys for this. I've gone a little bit over, but now I'm going to start. Um, these these recordings should populate, but they'll be in a date timestamp on your calendars. But if any of you guys wants to stay over and need help with setting up Google File Stream or getting your Google Calendar to show up, you know, it may not show anything until we have a due date. So we may want to wait until I propose a due date on something and then see if your calendar is actually, you know, syncing. So it's up to you. We can go through and look at it and see if you're doing everything correctly, but I'll be here until 1130. Okay, you guys. So you'll have two more sheets to do over the weekend. And I want you to start looking at chapter three in review, you know, just looking at chapter three in your books, because that's the next step. We're going to start into AutoCAD in chapter three. Okay. Any questions? Is anybody having problems downloading AutoCAD or getting verified that you're a student? I have to do that too. I have a couple of questions about the book. My book's still in the mail. Um, okay. The... The sheets in the back page that, that you pull out, are they full-size sheets? They're just the same size as what you could print, 8.5 by 11. Okay, but each individual box. Yeah. Is still the no, same as no the they're going to be, you're going to have nine, nine parts on every sheet, no matter what. Ah, uh, okay. You know, so it doesn't matter if you pull it out of the book or if you print it from here, it's going to be the same thing. Okay, okay. Yeah. That, okay. So yeah. Now, grid, there's not a specific measurement that you have to meet other than just the number of units. That's exactly right. It's so just the, the, the number of units, and sometimes it will be kind of in the middle of that. It might be one and a half units. Just try and eyeball it. You know, we're not, I'm not going to go measure this. I just really want to look at your projection of geometry. Okay, so we're not putting a scale to it or anything. That's right. That's exactly right. We're just trying to project geometry, and it's it's just baby steps. Okay, I was I was just wondering because some of these parts, you know, they're simple now, but as they get yes, real invasive, that's not very much room. Exactly. I have exactly. fat fingers, and so so they're going to get more exciting as we go, <laughs> and. Um, and we're going to be learning as we go. So it's just perfect. It's a, it's a constant um, graduation of difficulty and knowledge, kind of hand in hand. Well, as you move into AutoCAD, because it's, it's the same in, in Rhino and, and every other program, when you have fine detail, you can zoom in to draw the detail and then zoom back out. Uh, so, you know, 
on these kind of hand drawings that you know you can't do a lot of uh, a lot of detail, but in an electronic drafting program or whatever, you can get some really major, fun detail. Yeah, major there. detail. That's right. Yeah. Exactly. You know, from an Darrell, Darrell was asking, um, thank you guys. I just wanted to see who I can reach out to for any help and guidance. He's been in the dental management for 10 years and always had an interest in architecture. So if you guys uh, go to Hangouts, you know, you can talk as a class on Hangouts if you want to outside of class. So that's that's kind of our class interface in not being online with each other. So that might be a good way. Albert, knowing GIS before diving into civil engineering work, allowed me to manipulate data and read some civil engineering maps a whole lot easier if he hadn't before. So that's really a cool insight on that, Santiago. Thank you. Yo, I'm also taking the data collection or the, I guess, the data collection class for GIS, not uh -huh. the of GIS. Um, I couldn't get into that one, but I'm doing the data collection stuff. And the handy thing for me is, I already know data. I've been doing databases for almost 20 years.